All right, and it is 9 p.m. sharp here, 11 a.m. sharp in the West Coast, and 2 p.m. sharp in the East Coast. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. We've missed you. It's been a week. How are you? How is it going? How is your quarantine, social distancing, mask wearing? Um, luckily, this is no gathering, so I don't have to wear a mask. It's kind of funny, all this mask business. I have my reusable mask, of course, and I trust that you have yours as well. So thanks for joining us, guys. It's Brent and I tonight. Brent is co-hosting and is the police monitoring everybody that are on mute and not on video um, to make sure that you're all focused on me. Well, not on me, but on the story that we have to tell you tonight. Um, so we'll start a little bit with how we deal with Zoom. Okay, um, you will see you'll have a bar. Okay, and in that bar there is a chat window. When you click on that chat envelope, the chat opens. You will notice you have an option to share or send a message to everyone or just to the presenter. Uh, this is where you post your questions. So throughout the presentation, if you've got any questions, if you want to say something, please put it there. Brent will be gathering all the questions and then at the end of the presentation, we have a time for question and answers. So anything you want to say, put it there, right? Um, and I'll start by introducing myself for those of you who don't know me. I think most people kind of do. Um, my name is Ronnie. I work for Atlantis um, in the sales force. I handle our sales in Europe and Asia and at the moment stranded in Israel. Uh, normally on normal days, I reside in Dumaguete, where one of our resorts is located. I've been working for Atlantis for three and a half years. I've been living in the Philippines for four and a half years and three different islands. I dove, I can't say most of it, but I definitely can say the main places in the Philippines to dive. And tonight I wanna to tell you a beautiful, encouraging tale when it comes to marine conservation efforts in the Philippines. Um, I can't really see you raising your hands, but for those who have been in our Dumaguete location, I hope you got a chance to dive Apo Island. Apo Island is located about 45 minutes away from uh, Negros Oriental, which is where our Dawin Resort is located. And that is the story I want to tell you, is the story of this tiny island and its big impact on marine conservation efforts in the Philippines. So making sure my slides change here. A very, very famous of the photo of the Philippines, um, which is taken where? It's great because I can't hear you. So I can assume everybody says, Corone, Corone, Corone. And that is where this photo is located. Beautiful vertical islands, crystal blue water, a wonderful destination for wreck diving and a couple of other um, notable things like dugongs and beautiful reefs and Barracuda Lake. But that's a whole different topic of presentation. So the Philippines is an archipelago of uh, what the Philippine Department of Tourism likes to say is 7,107 islands, but actually last year we had a count and we're talking 7,461 islands, but we won't ruin their slogan. Um, and basically it's a group of many, many, many islands between large bodies of water, four large bodies of water, and it's quite a big landmass, uh, as opposed to popular belief that archipelagos are rather small in terms of their landmass. When you put it all together, you get country, a land, land mass size of Italy, which is quite a big uh, country, if you know. And we've got the Philippine Sea on the east, the South China Sea, or the North Philippine Sea on the west, and um, the Celebes Sea on the south, and the Sulu Sea on the southwest. So four large bodies of water, various currents coming in and out, rich in nutrients, creating it a global hotspot for marine biodiversity. Obviously, as it's located in the northwest side of the Coral Triangle. 
And the Coral Triangle is an imaginary triangle, including six aquatic nations. If you guys were here two weeks ago, I'm sorry, these two slides are repetitive. Give some background about the Philippines. But Coral Triangle facts, it's covered 5.7 square kilometers of ocean water, a lot of water. Over 500 reef building coral species, which accounts for 75% of the coral species in the world. And home to over 3000 species of fish, um, which account to about 60% of all the fish species in the world. Um, six out of the seven marine turtles in the world. And it is the coral triangle as a habitat for feeding, breeding, giving birth and a migration zone for many, many migratory animals, including mantas, uh, various schools of fish, tunas, whale sharks, various species of sharks, dugongs, you name it. So the basic idea you need to have in mind is that within the coral triangle, every time we look at any given point, putting our head in the water, we're likely to see more species of coral and fish than anywhere else in the world. And that is what attracts so many people to the Coral Triangle in general and to the Philippines in particular. So the tail of Apo Island, I wanna stop for a minute on the map that you see here. So we talked about the four large bodies of water and you can see them here, here where my mouse is hovering. This is the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea. We've got the Pacific Ocean here on the entire East Coast of the Philippines. Celebes Sea here on the South and the Sulu Sea here on the Southwest. Okay, Apple Island is located here where the tip of my cursor is in the Visayas, um, which is this group of islands right here, including this baby called Negros Island, divided into Negros Oriental and Negros Occidental. This is the fourth largest island of the Philippines, but only home to 2% of the Philippines' 100 million people population. So as you can see, it's very volcanic and it's very um, less populated than other islands. And we'll talk about what is it of Apo that makes it so special. Let me start for a minute at the end and then go back to the beginning. Um, let's talk for a minute about conversation, con conservation in the Philippines. Conservation in the Philippines is mainly organized in what's called MPAs, Marine Protected Areas. And actually there is a subdivision of that called SMPAs, which are Small Marine Protected Areas. And they are set under the National Integrated Protected Area Act, which means that on the federal government level, as well as the what you would in the states call the state level, what we call the province level. There are over 1,500 marine protected areas in the Philippines. Some of them are ginormous, like Tubataha Reef, like Apple Reef, but most of them are actually what we call SMPAs, small marine protected areas, which are 12 hectares in size. So how did it all begin? And this is the story of Apo Island. Fishing in the Philippines, prior to talking about conservation effort, let's talk about what is an obstacle in conservation efforts, and that is fishing. Fishing in the Philippines is not just an industry, it's a way of life. For all of you lovely people that have been in the Philippines, you must remember as we go out diving, you look around and you see these tiny little canoes, most of them with a row, and people fishing off them in traditional fishing techniques. So over 100 million Filipinos rely on the sea for their livelihood. Why? It's because their diet is predominantly coming from the sea. Yes, of course, this is a big pork nation, a big chicken nation, but all Filipinos, except the few vegetarian ones that I know, um, eat fish at least once a day. Whether breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever it is, fish and sea-related products, seaweed, crabs, you name it. 
and over a million Filipinos engage on a daily basis in marine fishing life. What does this mean? Filipinos go out in their small bunker boats, most of them homemade, to fish and the little that they fish, they either feed their family with and the surplus they will sell. So we're talking about by and large and coastal fishing, small operators or small scales that are still fishing using traditional low cost techniques like net, fish traps, bamboo fish traps, line fishing, um, nets that are actually not even laid via boats, but just people walking in on Sundays, families coming in on Sundays, all family members holding the net and they get close together, and scrape whatever they get. And all of these people are facing uncertain future as their daily catch has been dropping. And why? So what is causing the shortage of fish? Well, there are various reasons and none of them started yesterday. So I can imagine that some of you go like, oh, I know the answer to that. Of course, overfishing is the first reason. And deep sea commercial fishing, which started around the 70s and 80s in the Philippines. So we're talking these massive vessels with satellite vessels that are just empty in the ocean. We're talking about tons of fish on a daily basis. And once that started, obviously the fish on coastal fishing, the number has reduced. And when it comes to coastal fishing, those local fishermen are no innocent because they were engaging in destructive fishing techniques. In particular, two dynamite fishing, which when I came to the Philippines first time, geez man, it was like 10 years ago, and I was a dive guide in Bohol. So there was Pangla where everybody was diving and over there, there was no dynamite fishing. But as you went around the east side of Panglao over to the west side and started getting a bit further and further from the resorts, you would still hear dynamite fishing while diving. So we're not talking a very distant future, or sorry, distant past. And the one that I'm happy to say that has been about 20 years since we've been practicing this, um, there was a fascinating documentary by Howard Hall about Muroami. This is a Japanese name for an insane method of fishing. So, Basically, you get a boat and, and the boat has a massive block of concrete that is being lifted with a crane, dumped on the reef, breaking anything you can imagine. And then that same crane, basically with a huge net, <whistles> scrapes everything that we can take out. And of course, what we already know, but when this story started, people weren't sure or didn't know, is that the destroying the fish natural habitat actually damages their ability to reproduce. Well, when I say this now, you go like, duh. But take yourself back to the Philippines, what has only recently became a second world nation from a third world nation. Take yourself back 30 some years ago, and you find yourself in a very different scenario. Which scenario is that? So local fishermen in the Philippines have started seeing a decrease in their daily catch. And then came the project of Sumilon Island. And Sumilon Island was the first scientific project in the line of scientific research that are focusing on marine conservation, not as a tool for conservation for the ocean, but the conservation of the fishing industry or local low scale fishing industry in the Philippines. So Sumilon Island, some of you may know it and dove there. It's located off the coast of Cebu in front of Oslo, where we go dive and snorkel with the whale sharks. It's a small island that back in the days and still now don't have inhabitants on it. It's actually smaller than Apo Island, uh, but it used to be a place where all the fishermen from southern Cebu area would go fishing. It's got a beautiful um, 
sandbar that gets exposed in the low tide. It's, it's a really, really nice place. In 1974, Siliman University, not to be confused with Sumilon Island, similar names, but not the same. Sumilon University is located in Dumaguete City in the island of Negros Oriental, or island of Negros, but in the province of Negros Oriental, where one of our resorts is located. And that is actually one of the top marine biology institutions in the Philippines, even way back then. Um, this university launched a project to study the effect of a pilot marine protected area and what it would have on the surrounding fishing communities. So again, it's marine conservation as a method to improve fishing yields, not necessarily to protect the ocean. This is the guy who started all of this. Way back then, he didn't look this old. Today, he's 95 years old. He is a National Marine Scientist Award um, from the, the president of the Philippines. His name is Dr. Angel Alcala. And his assumption to his study was that a healthy ecosystem inside a marine protected area will benefit the surrounding communities through adult fish spillover. Basically what we're talking about is if you have an area where you're not fishing, the fish that are living in that area, if they get a chance to grow bigger and bigger, at some point, hopefully, or unhopefully for the fish, but hopefully for the fishermen, they're gonna swim out of that marine protected area into other areas that are not protected. This means we have a spillover from one area to another area of adult fish. Larval exchange, we will talk about that way, way more a bit later. But basically, as you know, fish have a larva phase and that phase in the fish life cycle is when the fish travels, non-migratory species, they travel the furthest when they do, when they're in larval phase. They're carried on the ocean currents and basically moving from one area, being settled on the reef in another area and growing up there or hatching there and growing there. So the idea is that larval exchange between marine protected areas or between a marine protected area and non-marine protected areas will cause a greater population of fish. So that was Dr. Alcala's goal, is to prove that a marine protected area will benefit the surrounding communities through adult fish spillover and larval exchange. He was able to score this project and to get access to Siliman Island and to halt all fishing at all in this small island. So between 1972 and 1984, he was able to sustain this place as a marine protected area and collect data. And what he found, well, his question of his research was how susceptible fish are to destructive fishing methods and to overfishing. So what happens if we take a place and we stop fishing? What's gonna happen? And also he wanted to study how long it takes the population to recover. So we already know that if we're gonna stop fishing, there's gonna be more fish, but how long does it take for that to happen? Because as you know, people are very impatient. So after 10 years of research, he was able to prove that the adult spillover from a marine protected area had a positive effect on the surrounding fishing communities. And he was able to actually prove this scientifically. And that proof was generating a concept that protecting part of the ocean is actually going to help small fishing communities on Coastal Negros, which is where the university is located and which is actually where Dr. Angel, Angel Alcala is from. So it wasn't about conservation again, but it was attaching a commercial and economical value that the locals could understand to the protection. 
Unfortunately, in 1984, there were local elections and the people who ran for office in that region in the southern tip of Cebu, which oversees Silliman Island, said, hey, now we've got all these fish. Forget this marine protected area. Let's go fish there. And that was their running line and they won. So the marine protected area status of Silliman of Sumilon Island was revoked due to that, to political powers. Nevertheless, the lesson was very, very important. And that lesson was taken to Apo Island. Apo Island actually pronounced Apo means grandchild in, in Tagalog, which is the national language in the Philippines. So Apo is right in front of a very, very, very tall mountain called Talinis, 1,903 meters in height. And Apo Island is right in front of it, a tiny peak that looks like it's the grandchild of this massive, massive volcano. And that's where it's got its name. It's got a thousand inhabitants on the island. There is no running water, uh, definitely no fresh water, uh, no electricity, no nothing. You've got a thousand people that all they live by is fishing. And as these people started seeing the yields of their catch decreasing, it had a direct effect on their livelihood because this is what they live from. So in 1982, when Dr. Alcala started seeing the political powers coming into the region and about to revoke the status of the marine protected area of Sumilan Island, he went to Apo Island. He didn't go there as a scientist. Well, he did, but he went there to the community, to the elderly of the community to explain to them the finding of his study and the importance that it has on their daily life. And the great news is that they listened. So in 1992, when Dr. Alcala came to Apo Island, he talked to them about creating a marine protected area. The people, by the way, who were then teenagers are today's leaders. And that is how he was able to secure the support of a local community to a marine protected area that is not created by a scientific research, by a university, or by the federal government declaring something or another, or even the state or the province government. It was the community itself that created 10% of the surrounding water, actually the southeast part of Apo Island, is a marine protected area. And it wasn't only that the marine, the community itself created it, it was the one who guarded it. So in 1986, they created the Marine Management Council, which banned, first of all, all destructive fishing method. So no more dynamite fishing, no more murami, no more net fishing, only line fishing, right? And no damaging of the reef. And also they created, they appointed what's called Bandai Dagat, or what we call sea shepherds in English. And these were people from the community who were guarding those 10% no take zone or marine protected area from the rest of the community for going in. So the enforcement was also from the community itself. And in 1994, Apo Island became part of the National Integrated Protected Act, which is what we talked about in the beginning, which 12 years later only became in effect from the federal government, but they've already been doing this for 12 years or so. And Apo Island Marine Protected Area is today the longest consecutive, most successful community managed marine protected area in the Philippines. Think about this for a minute. Since 1986, full protection, no destructive fishing techniques. And if you know, if you dove Apo Island, the coral life is insane. To imagine that 35 years ago, somebody was blowing up that reef is almost Un unperceived. So this is how short time and a small scale project was able to have such a big effect on us today as divers and of course on the local community. Because as you know today Apo Island doesn't live from fishing. It lives from our marine fees when we go diving there. 
And then not only that the success of Apo Island was important to the people of Apo Island, it had a trickle effect. And the message of Apo Island was carried on the currents to all the nearby communities, by and large, coastal Negros Oriental communities, who were also reliant on fishing for their livelihood. And nowadays, there are over 1,500 marine protected areas in the Philippines, a third of which are in the Visayas, where Apo Island is located. So that is the piece, the first piece of history. In more modern history, we have a second study that I'm going to present to you right now, which has an even greater implications on marine protection in the Philippines. Let's talk about larval export for a minute. So a reef fish life cycle, egg, larva, juvenile, when then it settles on the reef, and then adult. And actually after the adult, we've got another phase, a subphase, which is, no, not old, reproductive adult, right? So a fish that is actually able to reproduce. And that is different from the adulthood phase. So reef fish larva phase is about one to 10 weeks, depending on the species. And they get carried away by the ocean current until they settle on the reef. When they settle on the reef, they then transform into a juvenile fish. Hopefully, if nobody fish them when they're babies, they can grow older, right? Become an adult, and at some point, hopefully become a reproductive adult. So they can they have eggs, which then get fertilized and then become larva, and then travel again, and on on the cycle goes. So if fish larva travels far from home on the ocean current, and reaches adulthood and spawn somewhere, the more fish, fish larva cycles through the ocean, the more fish we have. It's kind of simple, simple math. So the big question is, how far from home do reef fish travel? And that was a topic of a study that was done actually in the 80s. So Dr. Rene Abesamis, um, who's a Filipino scientist who got his PhD from, oh my God, what is the name of this university in Australia? Will come to me in a minute. When he was doing his master's, he was studying with Dr. Angel Alcala in Dumaguete, because that's where he's from. He's also a good friend of mine and a really cool guy. Uh, but he spent two years collecting data from 3,000 um, vagabond butterfly fish, which is this fish that you see up here. Wait, sorry about that. This one, we all know him, right? You see where my cursor, perfect. So basically he was collecting DNA data from 3,000 um, different individuals of the vagabond butterfly fish, babies and adults, to figure out how far does fish larva travel. This was actually continuing the study that Dr. Angel Alcala started because what Dr. Rene Abisamis wanted to test or to prove is the relationship between different marine protected areas and why we should have more and more and more and more marine protected areas. And it's not necessarily about the size of the marine protected area, but yes, the quantity of the various marine protected areas. So we're studying the relationship between the marine protected areas. So um, he basically caught these fish and shaved them, which is really not so nice, but in the name of science, you know, people do random things. And he was looking for DNA matches between the juveniles and the parents. It took him a really long time. The center of his study was actually in Apo Island. And on the coastal communities along Negros Oriental. So he was trying to find the distance between the matching pairs to figure out how far they travel from where their parents had spawned and created the eggs and all that. And what he found after two years of study is that fish larva on average is traveling 85 kilometers away from where they were created and has reached as far as 120 kilometers. Okay, when you look at the map of the Visayas, this means that fish from Apo Island 
which this is a photo of Apo Island. It's coming up your screen in a minute. And to the right, a very hunky photo of Dr. Rene Abisamis. And his incredibly uncool dive watch. He's diving with a zoop, like me. And what he found, this means that the fish larva that is produced by one marine protected area has a strong chance of affecting other marine protected areas within 85 kilometers. Why? If you are a small fish, or if you are a fish larva and you're traveling and you settle on the reef in a non-marine protected area, you're very likely that the second you become a juvenile, maybe a couple of weeks later, you're out, right? Because remember those million Filipinos who are fishing with nets or lines or whatever it is, or reef or fish traps? They don't really distinguish between baby and adult and spawning adult and whatnot. So if you're landing on that part of the reef, you're a little bit out of luck. But if you're landing on a part of the reef that's a marine protected area, a no take zone, your chances of actually surviving and reaching an adult phase and becoming then a spawning adult are much greater. So the more marine protected areas we have, the greater population of fish that we have because we give more fish safe houses to grow up in. So that was Dr. Zabesame's study and what he was trying to prove, able to prove, is that a well-managed marine protected area like Apo Island can help the recovery of fish population in the neighboring communities. And not only neighboring communities off Negros Oriental, but different islands, because 120 kilometers from Apo Island, you will find Negros Oriental, of course, Occidental, Sikihor, Bohol, Cebu, and you remember Silliman University and Sumilon Island? Even Sumilon Island. So now we're talking five different islands that have a direct correlation to the success of a marine protected area at Apo Island. So connecting all the dots together, Females inside a marine protected area produce more eggs. This is actually one of the findings from Dr. Alcala's study. Well, imagine this, ladies. When you feel safe and at home, you kind of want to have more sex, right? Well, we want to reproduce more when we feel safe. When we are in danger, when our homes are being bombed, when we're being taken and killed, we are less likely to reproduce and to be able to produce more fertile eggs and not, right? So the same rationale exists for the fish. So if marine protected areas have more fertile females, marine protected areas also have correlation with each other through larval exchange, which can along with the adult spillover, if you remember those fish passing between the marine protected areas, have a positive effect on fish populations in overly fished, harassed, destroyed fishing locations in a very short time, actually 10 to 12 years at max, you will see a recover, almost a full recovery of the fish population. This is a really interesting graph um, that's coming up now. So this is basically everything that I talked about in this one slide. So this is Apple Island, guys, here, where my cursor is. I hope you can see that pretty clear. And this here is Negros Oriental with four different municipalities. Bakong, sorry, now being hidden by my, sorry, cursor. So we've got Bakon, Dawin, which is where our resort is located, Zamboangita, and Shaton. And where you see the white dots, these are marine protected areas. Notice that sadly, we have way more marine protected areas to the right side, which surprisingly is where dive resorts are located, because there is of course a synergy 
between the ability to have an economic impact on the local community by creating more jobs that are non-related to fishing. So Bakong, Tao, and Zamboangita, you'll see more marine protected areas. And then of course, Apo Island, Kapo and Zamboangita, and in Shaton. There's actually way more than that, more marine protected areas than the ones that are on the map now. But still, the synergies, if you look at the line, the, the dotted line are synergies between fishing grounds here and fish that came from marine protected areas. And the red lines, the non-dotted one, are the synergies between the two different marine protected areas. And of course, guys, all of this presentation is recorded and will be on our website. So if you want to come and have a look and print screen and, and read this, happy to share this also with you. And then, of course, comes the question of what we can do or what can we do, really, right? So a couple of small things. I'm not talking about changing everything in life. I can't tell you to stop eat fish. But the first thing that we can do is ask, okay? And when we ask, we find out more information. Try to support local communities in their efforts to conserve. Remember, a lot of these marine protected areas are not set by the government, at least not by the federal government. They are small provincial governments who are trying to convince their people, their fishermen, to not fish in a certain area and not fish in a certain area when the night comes. If you guys remember, if you've been to Dumaguete, when you look at the beach, outside of Atlantis Dumaguete, you see these wide buoys, right? There are these big, big, big wide buoys. Those are marine protected areas. That's where your fees are going. Those fees are going to the local government and the local government is trying to effectively, ineffectively, we can debate that, but make a case with the local fishermen, right? So by going and diving in these places, we are actually not only supporting local communities by staying in resorts, that provide jobs for these local communities that otherwise maybe would have been fishing illegally, right? But also we're supporting the local government in their effort to explain to the local community why we need to create those. Support national marine protected areas like Tubataha Reef, like Apo Reef, like Bali Kasag, um, you know, larger ones that you know where your fees are going and you know that the government is protecting those areas from being fished. And of course goes without saying, but do not support illegal fishing. Um, if you're seeing someone fishing inside a marine protected area, you know, try not to buy fish off the people on the coast. And the second thing is data, data, data. Why is data helpful? Data, on a scientific term, is helping us understand the changes that happen in the ocean and in fish population and whatnot as we implement different initiatives to protect the ocean. So how can we support and provide data? Well, there's a lot of citizen science vacations. Uh, Reef, R-E-E-F dot org is um, having several and actually several of those are coming to us these are scientific vacations where you go on your dive vacation and actually get assigned a scientific a scientific um, assignment of counting fish of counting the size of fish of counting the health or looking at the health of the corals um, and all these things are helping us collect data and this data is helping us validate just like dr angel alcala years ago the need for marine conservation in these first and second, or sorry, second and third world communities. And regional marine life recording applications. Um, today you can go to places like the Great Barrier Reef and you can download app or Cayman Islands or whatnot and you can download an app that's in Google Play and stuff and where you can actually record sightings of various species, whether it's sharks, turtles, you name it, but that collective data, you know, a little bit like Wikipedia, if you think about it, helps scientists have an idea of what's out there. And using us as a tool, as a participant, as an active participant in these efforts. So yes, maybe it's small, 
but at least there are different, definitely things that we can do to help support these efforts and to help support the marine protected areas in the Philippines, to help support local communities that are initiating them. And more importantly, you telling everybody about these efforts and about this presentation and other initiatives alike that people can go and educate themselves on. So guys, we are waiting for you. We are waiting for you to come and die with us and come and support and come and count species if you want. And a very, 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 very big, big thank you to the people listed here on the bottom who have been taking pictures and helped me through this study uh, and to the preparation of this presentation. Uh, Renea Basamis, who's a great friend, uh, Grid Magazine, who did an article with a similar topic Eduardo Aceveres, Boaz Samurai, Simon Lawrence, Sonny Thacker, who have donated their wonderful photos to this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. And it's time for your questions. Let me unmute Mr. Brent. Hello, Ronnie. Hello, everybody. Okay, I beat you to it, I think. I clicked off my own microphone. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, fantastic presentation, Ronnie. I think I speak for, for all of us saying, you know, really, really interesting, both in terms of what's being done in the Philippines, what's being done at Apple Island, and what's being done worldwide, really, to, to combat that problem of local, local communities wanting to, to eat and feed themselves off the reefs, and how do we create a balance of, of getting them to stop doing that while supporting the local economy. So I think that was really interesting. So I'll jump back in with a, a question here we have from Tracy. And do you think that by introducing the blackwater diving experiences, we are helping maybe more people understand the larval phases and the way those um, larval stage fish and marine life feed and possibly disperse? Absolutely, excellent question. Um, I think blackwater diving is, is not new to the diving world, but I'm surprised by how many people haven't actually done it. And when you talk to divers, you know, you always think, oh, these guys are number one protectors of the ocean. Well, you know, not all of them. So yeah, absolutely. I think if people get exposed to the larval phase, if people see it, if people understand how it behaves, I mean, even when I, and I've done blackwater diving, even when I went through this, this study for this presentation and for this topic of marine protected area history in the Philippines, I learned so much. I didn't know how far fish larval travels. So yes, I think anything that you expose people to, you create a firsthand experience. And when people see it, they can imagine it, they can protect it, and they can relate to it. So absolutely, absolutely. And of course, we okay. all have water diving in both of our facilities. Okay, and here we go. Um, perfect, thanks, Ronnie. Um, do you, this one is from Eric. Do you host or offer dive opportunities that allow divers to collect data for ongoing research projects or to participate in marine conservation in the area? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so this one is, does Atlantis host or offer dive opportunities that allow divers to collect data for ongoing research projects or to participate in marine conservation in the area? Well, okay, a couple, couple of things for, um, to that matter. Um, first of all, we work with reef.org. We're actually a gold donor to reef.org, R-E-E-F.org. And reef.org organizes many such citizen science trips. Um, and some of them have been to Atlantis. So that is definitely one outlet that we operate in. Second, we work with the California Academy of Science that comes out and does various studies. One study that they've done is actually on the growth um, pattern of corals in Apple Island. So Dr. Terry Gossinger, who is with the California Academy of Sciences, who was leading that project. That wasn't a project that was open to our divers, but while he was staying in our resort in Dumaguete for three weeks doing the study, um, he was talking and presenting almost every night or twice a week to the guests that were in the resort and speaking about the scientific um, study that he's doing over there. He also did a different study about nudibranchs in our Portugalera resort. So we are involved in that and through 
um, let's call it ideal spillover of being in the same resort at the same time, you are able to, to learn more about these things. Um, another thing that we do is obviously pay marine protected fees um, and help you guys purchase the tickets to that. And we are a big advocate when it comes to the marine protected area of console that we have in Negros Oriental and actually on along Darwin coast. So we are a very active participant um, in the Darwin community, in the Darwin diving community, and we have ongoing meetings uh, with the government. And lately we have adopted a dive site, which actually means that right in front of Atlantis, we have a dive site that we adopted, we are responsible for. We are responsible for the mooring line there. And not only that we're responsible to make sure that this is available for people to dive without putting an anchor or whatnot. Um, we're also, when we dive there regularly, we're collecting data about the fish population and size and submitting that to the local authority. Um, that is not a project that is yet open to our divers because it's literally just begun um, about five months ago. But uh, by us adopting a dive site that is helping to create that uh, repository of data. And I, Personally, I'm open to hearing any ideas that you might have about how we can create these opportunities for you um, and looking to always learn what other people are doing in the field. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of um, citizen science projects and we are participating via reef.org. Okay, excellent. Um, and going to, to Apple Island and some of the, some of the logistics, um, does the local community, the Pandai Dagat, still protect um, Apple Island? Is there is someone like the Coast Guard or a larger entity protecting it? I guess, who is enforcing the laws? So basically, in Apple Island, like we said, it's a marine protected, or it's a marine led, sorry, it's a marine protected area led by the community, uh, which means that to this day, we have the Pandai Dagat. You will see them when you go to Apo on, on our boat. Um, and when you come to Apo Island, you will see they actually, they're the only ones in Apo Island that have these um, small speed boats because everybody else has their little bunker boat. Remember, not all of Apo Island is a marine protected area, right? So we still have places where the locals can fish. But in the marine protected areas, it's the Bandai Dagat that are controlling that. And today the main income is from the marine park fees that are being paid to Apo Island, which is actually under the jurisdiction of San Bonita. Um, in Negros Oriental and also their main source of income and you will see this and if you've been there you have seen this is during our surface interval and our lunch break you have the local ladies coming out with a canoe selling t-shirts and sarongs and tank tops for women and kids and stuff like that and that is really where they make their livelihood so yeah it is the community who's still protecting that and the community who's also seeing the impact of the influx of tourists, of diving tourists and snorkeling tourists, right? Because it's also an excellent snorkeling site um, on their income. Perfect, okay. And then one last one, um, an easy one here. Are you allowed to wear gloves at Apple Island and in some of these Philippines marine parks? Um, no, <laughs> and there's really no reason for you to do so because you're talking about a water that at worst is, um, I don't know, 72 Fahrenheit or 23 degrees Celsius. And at best, sorry, I like hot water. Um, we're talking upper 80s or 30 degrees Celsius. So there's really no reason to be wearing gloves because it's really not cold. Um, and we don't have that many stingers in the water like you sometimes have in, in Cali or whatnot. So um, there's no reason to be wearing them. Um, and we don't allow that. Um, the reason most people are wearing gloves is to be able to touch, and it, it's difficult to prevent people from doing that. Um, the enforcement of that is obviously difficult as depending on the dive guides. Um, Tubataha Marine Park and Apo Reef, not Apo Island, Apo Reef up in the north, have a strict no glove policy, and any diver who is caught wearing a dive, uh, dive uh, gloves um, is being fined, and as well as the boat that he's on. Um, in Negros, you know, we try to enforce it as much as we can. If you have a medical condition, we do let people, we're trying to be rational, but uh, there, we do have a no glove policy. Okay, perfect. And one final question here, is there a best time to dive in Dowin and Dumaguete and Apple Island? Well, the beauty of the Philippines in general, and especially the Visayas, is that it's really good year round. So the diving in the Philippines is good year round and 
some of the guests on this chat, like Tracy, who's been in different times and different times of the year, um, can can account for that. But we have seasons in the Philippines, and those seasons differ in terms of water temperature, the direction of the wind, and the currents that are coming in, and that affects the different types of species that we have and that we see throughout the different seasons. So Philippine diving is great year round. It's not that you're going to go a certain month and say, oh man, this is, this is nothing to compare to last month or two months from now. It differs, it differs. Um, our, basically we have two main seasons and those are determined by the direction of the winds and the directions of the two global currents that we're under. We are six degrees off the equator, which means we're a tropical island. The chance of rain is more or less equal um, in the rainy season and in various days. So we do, we can have, even in the rainy season, we can have beautiful sunny days or we can have rainy days. But even when it's rainy, you can still go diving. Normally in the Philippines, it's quite easy diving conditions, especially on coastal diving, especially in Dumaguete and in Apo. We don't tend to have a lot of current. We don't tend to have very deep water. Uh, Apo's wall goes down to about maybe 80 meters at most, at the deepest point. So it's not a super deep place um, and no ripping currents. So there's not really a right or best time per se, but it's different times of the year. Do you want me to okay. describe the seasons? Nope, I think that sums it up pretty much. Um, sure. Wanted to give a little overview there. Um, and I think that's it for questions. But again, thank you, Ronnie. This has been really informative um, from all of us. Excellent. Well, you guys, this presentation will be on our um, uh, web page. It's, uh, we can send you the link, but if you go under into our website and you go to the main menu under guest corner, there is a sub menu called webinars. You can see the upcoming webinars like the one my buddy Brent here is hosting next week. We can see the previous ones and can see everything that we're doing in terms of our online presence. Um, to give you an update from our wonderful resorts, we are looking forward to seeing you guys once the ban is lifted. Uh, the resorts at the moment are semi-closed. We have a skeleton crew in each resort. We're waiting for the Philippines lockdown to end. We are doing well. The staff is doing well. The vegetation is doing well. Uh, the fish population is waiting for you, and so are all of us. Thank you for your time in this morning, afternoon, evening, and we look forward to seeing you in our next webinars. Bye.